For me, a great story is what defines a great JRPG. These games have presented to me some of the best narratives ever devised, and today with a spoiler warning I want to share 7 JRPGs that had mature yet memorable stories. And we're going to be starting with Yoko Taro's masterpiece in Nier Automata. No question in my mind, one of the greatest action RPGs ever made, and it will maintain its legacy well into the future. It's had anime adaptations, collaborations, including an involved offering in Final Fantasy XIV, and a hell of a lot of figures. 2B's design helped here, but under these superficial elements, Nier Automata is just a legendary JRPG, and one proponent of that is its storytelling. Not contemporary for sure, but at the same time, engaging and riveting. Nier Automata takes place in the distant future. Earth has been overrun by alien machines that invaded the planet, forcing the remains of humanity to retreat to the moon. Before doing so, however, androids called the Yorha units were created, who engage in this sort of proxy war against the machines in a seemingly endless struggle. These androids are led to believe that they are fighting to reclaim Earth for the humans, but as the game progresses it becomes very clear that this has somewhat lost its meaning. The game covers many notable themes like existentialism, the meaning of humanity, and defying one's intended fate. Nier Automata is undoubtedly a game that oozes emotional depth. It gets you to question the nature of existence and also the consequences of your choices. And in typical Yoko Taro fashion, it's not given to you on a plate. You'll be playing through the game several times to not only see the multiple perspectives, but to slowly piece together your own opinion. What really stuck out to me for Nier Automata was seeing this never-ending cycle of war between the machines and the androids, a war that by the time we play the game has no meaning as humanity has long since died out. So what is the true purpose of existence in this case? Yet in their place, there are civilizations that are evolving in their own ways. The machines, for example, have taken on human characteristics and when you play through 9S's route, you get to see that firsthand. One of the most memorable fights in the game, Simone, is a key indicator of this shift in the psyche of machines. Simone was driven by love to become more beautiful in order to win the affection of another. But over time that drove her mad and sadistic, eerily human qualities it can be said. Nier Automata is just full of moments like this. Events that aren't clearly presented to you, but keep you coming back for more. And this is one reason why I consider it one of the best stories ever devised. And talking about memorable stories that you can't afford to miss, I want to point you in the direction of Witchspring R, who are today's sponsor. Developed by Kiwi Walks and part of the wider Witchspring series, Witchspring R is known for its captivating blend of story-driven gameplay, character development, and simulation mechanics. Fans of series like Atelier or Rune Factory will likely find something to love here. In this adventure, you take control of Pieberry, a white-haired, bunny-eared witch growing up in a forest filled with monsters. Pieberry, which is a combined name of her favourite foods, pie and strawberries, is attempting to relive her childhood, and as such, the game takes on a more light-hearted approach that is designed to appeal to both beginners and veteran RPG players. Even with that, narrative is at the forefront of the adventure too, with a fair amount of twists and optional cutscenes based upon the side content you partake in, along with a full voiceover in Korean and Japanese. On top of this, there is a focus on gathering and crafting for those more in tune with that approach, allowing the player to build Pieberry in the way they want. This game has certainly captured the imagination of turn-based fans since its release in 2023, as at the time of recording, it has sold over 100,000 units worldwide and sits at an overwhelmingly positive rating on Steam with over 4,500 reviews. In addition, the game has just launched on the likes of PS5 and Nintendo Switch, with an Xbox One version also in the works. If this sounds like the game for you, check it out via my link in the description and pinned comment, Physical and digital options are available, along with a limited edition. Thank you to Kiwi Walks and Witchspring R for sponsoring today's video, and thank you for listening. And now, back to the video. Our next entry will be for Mistwalker's sadly forgotten magnum opus in Lost Odyssey. Lost Odyssey was one of the first JRPGs I played when I started to get into the genre properly in my mid-teens, and it remains at the peak of storytelling, sharing it with only a few others. There is something profound and mature about the story of Lost Odyssey. It goes down a route that many have tried to replicate, but none have managed to do it as well. Lost Odyssey takes place in a world on the cusp of a magic industrial revolution, where magic is being integrated with technology to transform society. 
The growing use of magic has led to political conflict, economic inequality, and the rise of powerful empires. This magic also acts as the focus of a planned uprising that threatens to destabilise the world further. At the forefront of this is the protagonist Kaim, a 1,000 year old immortal who works for the governments of Ura as a sort of agent. Due to his long life, Kaim has witnessed countless battles and experienced loss on numerous occasions and by the time we see him in game, he is notably guarded and some might even say emotionless. It only stands to reason that after seeing so much turmoil, one would eventually become numb to it. But another part of the narrative is based around the idea that Kaim has lost his memories, and over the course of the game he slowly regains them. While a lot of it is presented through the course of the main story, much more is shown through these short excerpts called A Thousand Year of Dreams, recounting his past experiences, loss and grief over his long life. Kaim of course is not the only excellent character here, there are others like Seth and Sarah who also suffer from the same burden. And what makes it so relatable is that each of them deals with the curse of immortality in different ways. Kaim of course lost his memories for instance, while Sarah, his wife, secluded herself away after her mortal daughter passed on. Even by the end, it feels like the game ends in a bittersweet way. The knowledge that immortals like Kaim will not be able to live with their cherished ones for eternity, but the importance is making sure those fleeting moments remain a memory that live long after death. In fact, the next two entries are going to be quite similar to Lost Odyssey in terms of the theme covered, though they go about it in different ways. The next entry will be Final Fantasy IX, a game which I very recently finished myself. Undoubtedly, the highlight of this game for me was the story. It's very well crafted and clearly focused around the central theme of life and death. The game begins in the Kingdom of Alexandria, where a massive festival is taking place for the 16th birthday of Princess Garnet. The crowning jewel of this festival is a play conducted by the drama troupe Tantalus, who are going to be performing a favourite called I Want To Be Your Canary. This theatrical opening to the game is a foreshadowing to the eventual experience that will be presented. Final Fantasy IX does feel like a fantastical play in many respects, with thrilling climaxes at the end of each disc. And as it goes on, you quickly understand what the message of the game is. Characters display the umbrella of death through loss, grief and acceptance throughout the story, and how they grow from that is what makes it so impactful. And while all the characters weave around this theme in some way, it doesn't become any more apparent than when you're watching Vivi and Kuja. Both of them are similar in terms of background, they both have to come to terms with the fact that they will live short lives, but despite that, they handle the fear of death in different ways. One goes mad, while the other seeks to live a life of meaning. Ultimately though, despite their approaches, the beauty of the story is that their memories remain. People still remember both of them after they have long passed. Final Fantasy IX presents this message of not fearing death, understanding that life is fleeting, but making a difference in our own way. For through our positive actions, we will remain as fond memories for others. Now the other game that is centred around the theme of death and acceptance is Persona 3 Reload. Reload also has an excellent story. It excels in many other areas too, and as my first experience of Persona 3, I was blown away by it, but the story once again was the highlight for me. Though its message is quite similar to Final Fantasy IX, I feel that Persona 3 Reload is more multifaceted in how it approaches the theme of death and loss. It's not as direct as Final Fantasy IX was. The core theme of the game is there, front and centre for pretty much the entire runtime. You are aware of mortality, you are aware of the potential threat of death, but it handles that truth and eventual acceptance in many different ways. Persona 3 not only uses its story as a proponent of exploring the theme, but it also uses its various social links, all of them linked in some way to the theme of loss. Whether it's a Star Trek runner no longer being able to pursue his dream so that he can look after his family, or a child losing her parents after a divorce, every single one is linked to the theme of loss. But they all share another common factor. They all result in a form of acceptance by the end. The social links all go through the denial, anger, bargaining, depression and then acceptance phases of grief. They all display the intended message of Persona 3 Reload. These characters have had to experience loss in some way, but they all come out of it stronger. And that message is conveyed to the player through so many different angles. The concept of loss and death is something that is an obstacle in some ways, but it should never define you. It's something that has to be accepted. And come the game's conclusion, you realise this through the main character. He takes the literal embodiment of death within himself for his friends and happily passes on before the credits roll, knowing he did so so that the ones he cared about can live on. 
We move now to Vanillaware, and yeah, it's a hybrid visual novel with strategic gameplay, but I am not doing a video on memorable stories without mentioning 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, one of the finest sci-fi centric narratives I have ever experienced. Aegis Rim is just a marvel in terms of storytelling. It is so engaging, so enjoyable, so mature, and it just kept me coming back for more. I would be staying up late into the night just because I wanted to see what happened next. Not many games can hook me in like that, but Aegis Rim was one of them. I've said it before, I liken Aegis Rim to a jigsaw. It has a central mystery and the jigsaw pieces are the roots that slowly work from the outside before the picture becomes whole, and it does it superbly. The plot is intricate and weaves together different narrative threads, each centred on one of the 13 protagonists, all of whom pilot giant mechs called Sentinels to defend humanity from an invasion of mechanical kaiju. However, over time you start to understand what the true purpose of the Sentinels is. Its seemingly simple premise is anything but that, and it culminates in a thematically gripping finale. While I don't think the gameplay is anything to write home about, it just hit every emotional angle it needed to, and I felt relieved when it finally ended, not because I wanted the game to be done, but because it had me at the edge of my seat as the pressure continued to mount. 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim succeeds because of its incredibly layered, multifaceted story that never lets up for the entire playthrough. It's ambitious, it's innovative, it's beautiful to look at, and it just kept me hooked from start to finish. The penultimate game will be Tales of the Abyss. It was very close between this and Berseria, but maybe there's a little recency bias here since I only played Abyss about three months ago. Even so, Abyss is tied at the top of the Tales of series for me because of its story and characters, with Luke being the main reason. There seem to be some people who don't like Luke because he was a brat and he changed too quickly, but I don't think that's true at all. His development is extremely well handled as far as I'm concerned, and it makes sense that when he does resolve to change, it takes a while for all the other characters to warm up to him again. Let's be real here, by the end of Act 1, Luke pretty much caused a genocide, and that was purely because of his hubris. What makes the build-up to Act 1's climax so good is that it makes sense. It's fully understandable based upon what you see from the perspective of Luke. During those first 10 hours or so, you're listening to all the other characters talk about phonons and the score, and for someone who has just started, it's a lot of jargon to take in. Luke is in the same boat. He has been shut off from the world for so long that it's understandable he doesn't know what is going on outside his manor. What makes it worse though is that he is treated like an idiot for not knowing this stuff, which clearly isn't his fault. Luke is often left out of the important conversations early on because all the other party members just see him as a spoiled kid. And I can relate to him there because I was struggling to understand all this terminology too in the early stages. The relationship between Luke and the player works because you are effectively in the same shoes as Luke himself. So it's no wonder that when Luke gains a position of authority, which he feels will act as a method to him proving his worth, he just barrels on ahead without any regard for the more minor details. He just blindly listens to his Swordmaster Van, who, let me reiterate, is the only one who really shows him respect at this point. The ultimate outcome of this in the finale to Act 1 will likely stay in my mind for years. Watching that child sink into the ooze while the other characters are helpless to stop it is one of the most harrowing moments I've seen in a JRPG. While I don't think Act 1 is ever topped in Abyss, it certainly comes close come Act 3. And that's saying something because the opening moments of the game are peak storytelling in my eyes. The final game for this list, well, a Trails game had to get in here somewhere, it was just a matter of choosing which one. Sky Second Chapter, Cold Steel 4, Asya, all fantastic in their own rights, but I'm going to go with Trails from Zero, because it quite simply has what I think is the darkest story in all of Trails to this day. While other games like Sky the Third have infamous scenes in of themselves, I think that the overall ambience and tone of Zero is just more mature and harrowing than the other games. I still remember hearing Chief Sergei talking about the DG cult for the first time and the discovery of the Gnosis drug. It still gives me chills even now. And when you start to dig into what the DG cult has done, and what the remnants of that organisation continue to do, you just feel disgust and anger especially when you realise that several characters in this game were involved with them in some way, one being my favourite character in the whole series. I mean for real, child kidnappings followed by inhumane experimentation that caused many of them to die in order to achieve this higher existence beyond the eyes of the goddess. 
Some people are irredeemable, and Joachim for me remains as the most deplorable character in the Trail series, even more so than Weissman. What makes Trails from Zero so memorable to me is that the trauma of the events surrounding the DG cult still haunt these characters much later on in their lives. You only need to look at Trails through Daybreak, the latest game in the series, to realise this. It makes that conclusion to the game all the more satisfying, especially for the Sky Trio of Estelle, Joshua and Ren who finally reunite. The individual story of Ren remains one of my favourite character arcs ever conceived. So well told, so well executed, and it actually sticks the landing. There's no wonder that to this day, Ren is one of the most beloved characters in Trails and she'll continue to hold that accolade. While her story is now mostly complete, she still shows remnants of her past that are called back to, many of them explained in Trails from Zero. While this game isn't my favourite in the series, it is undoubtedly one of the best in terms of its narrative. Mature, harrowing and extremely well handled, Trails from Zero long lives in my memory even years later. Thank you for watching this video, if you liked it please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace!